What is up, everyone? Welcome to the first edition, the pilot episode of the Run Flat podcast. I am your co-host, Matt Feldick, joined by my esteemed colleague, Skylar Hall. Skylar, how are you doing, my friend? Dude, I am good. Life is good. 2023 is off to a raging start. And we've got to add to, to the glory that's going to be this year, man. Super excited to be doing this with you. Dude, I feel How are you like... doing, man? I'm good. I feel like we've talked about this podcast for so long now uh, that it's it's finally coming to life. Uh, we are we're making it happen. And the gist of this podcast, as you can tell, the Run Flat podcast, we're going to talk all of the you know groundbreaking topics in the uh, track and road space, including uh, you know college um, college track cross country kind of all of those all of those things so yeah excited to uh excited to get things kind of kicked off here what perfect timing as you know we're just we're getting close we're getting close to the uh to the track season being upon us how excited are you dude i'm stoked like there's been so much development in both the sort of like youth and college scene as well as the pro scene like obviously last year was record breaking, uh, especially in the mid distance and distance realm for for track. Um, how many how many college kids went like sub four in the mile? Um, so super excited for for indoor season to get into full swing here momentarily. And then on the pro side, this is gonna be a wild year, right? We just had a world championship year. We have a world cross champs. We have a world outdoor champs indoor will be whatever it is um and then like and then we're in an olympic cycle and then like all hell is going to break loose so the next 19 months are just going to be phenomenal for uh for the run flat stay low brand i'm I'm here for it yeah i mean we'll get to this a little bit later but this is a super exciting time in the sport right we come off of uh world champs in eugene we follow that up with another world champs year which is obviously very atypical and then that mm-hmm. leads you right into an Olympic year. So just so much going on in the sport and, uh, yeah, really exciting times. And speaking of, you know, getting into the Olympic cycle, I'm going to throw this to you in a moment, but we're going to get to topic number one here in the show. The Paris Olympic track and field schedule was released, and it finally feels like World Athletics maybe listened to the people uh, <laughs> for once here, you know. Um, they went to nine days on the track, whereas in Eugene, they were at 10. Um, they've gone to kind of fixing the schedule so that we can see potentially some of our uh, favorite athletes on the track more. So I'll throw it to you. What about the schedule uh, for the 2024 Paris Olympics kind of most excites you? Yeah, so uh, I mean, there's two ways for me to take this, right? There's what is possible and then there's what is guaranteed. So in the what is guaranteed thing that excites me, I mean, I'm gonna be real with you. I might be in the, the strong minority on this, but this is gonna be the first Olympics where we have these, was it the repetage, repassage? I, I honestly don't know how to pronounce this, um, but it's basically, instead of having a bunch of miscellaneous time qualifiers go through, it's an opportunity for people who get kicked out in the first round to race their way back into the semifinals, which, you know, last year we saw Cole Hawker sort of go down uh, very early on in the heats, and, and that was a huge surprise. We've seen it happen a handful of times over the past you know 10 12 years to see somebody who you know might just like rise from the ashes a true like phoenician story could be very entertaining even with an extra race in their legs so i'm very entertained to see how that how that shakes out um and also if that plays into some strategy for some folks because some of the doubles that could occur you might be better served to just sort of like not run that hard heat one just to like save your legs for a final that might be that same night and then be able to come back and, and race your way in 
through a second or third event. So that brings me to the other part I'm super excited about, which is like the the number of absurd individuals that we have right now who are like right in their prime athletic potential who are going to be able to double or potentially triple at these olympics and a lot of it happens on the sprint side you know we we have the opportunity to see um the the 100 the 200 the 200 400 type folks but we're going to have you know the 15 fives as always we're going to have the 510 or we're going to have a 15 510 maybe we've seen we, we saw that go down in in tokyo and then Listen, I'm going to be real with you. The only thing I cared about when this schedule came out was whether or not Sydney McLaughlin, uh, now married, congratulations on that, um, can run this 400 open, 400 hurdle double. And it makes perfect, like it lines up perfectly for her. I don't know if they attempted to do this because like World Athletics had was holding this hope and dream. But listen, you just got to run one 400 every day for like eight days and then like i guess we can throw you on the four by four to to cap it off as well it's just gonna be absolutely insane if she pulls this off and like why not you've already set the world record how many years in a row like i'm just i mean i just i want it to happen so bad so i just i just need her to stay healthy and have a good 23 so that this can be the world in which we live in when city takes over and it's just like athlete of the year regardless of sport yeah i mean just to touch on that i think that <clears throat> you kind of nailed it i think that being able to race yourself back into the finals is super interesting, right? Like that'll be really, I'll be really keen to see kind of how that plays out. But the first thing that came to mind when uh, this schedule was released was first we get medals on day one. So given uh, the race yes. walk, a little bit of respect, you know, you get a little amped up for the Olympics. Maybe you're more likely to tune into this knowing that there's a medal on the line at day one. Um, but was the fact that, yeah, we're able like basically any feasible double combination is on the table. Right. And so, um, you know, I'll throw this to you in just a second, but you, you hit on, you know, Sydney in the 400 flat and 400 hurdles. Could we see a Jakob Ingebrigtsen with the 10 K 15, 5 K triple? Could we see... A Fred Curley 100 400 double. I want that. So that much. I believe is in play. And so the question I'll send back to you is uh, you know, what possible, like legitimate possibility most excites you about this schedule? Yeah. So the, I mean, Cindy would be great. She should dominate either of those. And like if she just did one of them, should win on paper. Like, She's the favorite. So, like, yes, that'd be great to see. It'd be groundbreaking and revolutionary. Um, but that that Ingi, that that Ingelbritson triple, right? We we saw it attempted to some degree uh last year, but to have a, a person who actually is good across the board, like he just won Euro Cross, so he's good at that, you know, 10k distance. We've seen him put together a very solid 5K uh, multiple times last year with 13, 13 low. Um, like we, we ran like a 1303 at sound running last year and he signed up like three days before. He's like, yeah, I'm in the middle of a training camp in Flagstaff. I'll pop down and like rip one real quick. Um, and then obviously we know what he's done uh, in his primary event, the 1500. So it makes total sense that he like given the aerobic base that he has, like the precision, the precision that the the Norwegians have just been like on, not just in track, but like cycling and triathlon. Like if he's if he really wanted to make this happen, that would be a legitimate threat to win across all three. And that's that's wild. Like you don't see that in uh, on the men's side of the sport. And he's still so young. He's like, like he would be in, in in college still if he was in the American system. So uh, yeah, I think that this is, this is prime like Ingi takeover uh, territory if, if he wants it. Yeah. I mean, it'll be interesting to see if he, you know, qualifies or enters the 10 K. Cause I think that that will ultimately kind of set the foundation, right? It's the first final of, of the three, but uh, yeah, him, that one excites me again. I think that the 100 400 double from Fred would be something that 
you know, is super exciting and something that like only a handful of people would have the legitimate possibility of doing. And one of those people is Fred Curley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I listen, we, we forget how good Fred was in the open four because he came out of no, like everybody thought him going to the one was just a way to work on, you know, first phase and the, you know, just making sure that he had the speed to then go back to the two and the four. And then he came out and dominated worlds. So it, the fact that I honestly don't think it's ever been done. Somebody's won uh, the one in the four in the last, what, 30, 30 to 40 years, sort of like the, the newer modern era uh, of track. It's just not a double that most people do. It's not a double that people do in high school or college when your coach just throws you out there for points. You know, they might have you run a run the open one and have to throw you in the four by four. But to actually be good at both. Um, at a world class level um, is rare. It's it's not a a skill set we see a lot. You know, Noah Lyles, the best in the world in the two hundred, has been okay at the one hundred, but like we've seen him struggle. Uh, then you have somebody who goes like the other way, like a, a Fanbula, who is so slow out the blocks that like he might he's probably that next generation uh, sort of a, along with Arian Knight and who should be good at that like two four bucket, um, but you. But because he's so slow out the blocks, you wouldn't expect him to be good in the 100. So this is such a rare, rare beast of a man in Fred Curley um, that's so that he he's in such a prime position with a just a skill set that so few people in history have had. Um, and if he wants it, it, it's his for the taking. And, uh, you know, what better time than now? Right. Because you have world championships two years in a row, an Olympic cycle. And if things break bad. Then you have a world championships the year after that again. So it's, hey, listen, you you can still walk out in a four-year period, a normal Olympiad, with how many medals, even if one of these sort of like goes off the rails. Like it's it's, it's a great time to be alive. Yeah, most definitely. And just a note before we move on to the next topic, 1952 Olympics, Herb McKinley of Jamaica, silver in the 100 and the 400. There you go. It's just not a double that happens. Like it's yep. different training. It's just different training. I don't, they're both sprints, but it's, de it's just, it's different, but he's built different. So uh, we'll see how this year shakes out. If he runs a few more two hundreds, um, sort of make sure that he's sort of extending out that speed endurance, uh, not, not getting too lax days ago, but super, super stoked for, for the U S uh, sprint crew. Like this sets up to be like the U.S. typically dominates uh, the Olympics, but this sets up to be a remarkable year, 800 on down men's and women's side for us to just just go wild. It's going to be like the time when they changed softball, like they took it out the Olympics because the U.S. was dominating it that much. That's the potential we have. They're not going to take out track, obviously, but um, but that's the level of domination we could put down on the track um, if if these things go according to plan. And it's if you are if you are between the ages of like 19 and 27 right now, like this is the greatest time to be a professional athlete and, and running because the opportunities are just so much higher right now than than in any other time in our history. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Moving on now to second topic uh, just announced recently, Chris Selensky leaving the University of Florida going to join his former coach, Jerry Schumacher, at the University of Oregon. And the question I have for you on this, Skylar, is this the Oregon Ducks' return to a true distance legacy program in the collegiate ranks? It's got to be, right? I mean, when you think about the, the, the coaching staff that – Jerry has built at Oregon. It is some of the folks who transitioned to the pros well, continue to find success, and then have come back and have a demonstrated history of actually developing talent, right? We see oftentimes in any number of sports, somebody goes pro, they start coaching the same way that they were coached, and it doesn't necessarily, uh, it, it doesn't help the folks are bringing along. Sure, they're flashy. They might be able to bring in recruits or anything, but um, but they're not seeing the results actually on paper. Between, you know, Shalane, 
clearly helping in the back of uh, BTC for for a long time, building up really that women's that women's unit. We've seen the success that they've had um, even after many of them have left the program. And then for for Zelensky, Florida not known for being a distance powerhouse. Um, and they've had some sneaky good folks, including obviously uh, Parker Valby this past year, uh, finally getting the shine. It's really two years in a row uh, that she's been performing at this level. But but last year was where she really uh, was on center stage for taking out that, uh, that cross country race at nationals and sure getting run down in the last 300 or so meters. But, uh, but that was how she was running all year, just highly successful. So, I, if Oregon doesn't come back to being a distance powerhouse within the next two to four years, especially with the recruits that they already have lined up um, and some of the talent they already have on 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 paper, you I would essentially call it a failure. Right. Like college is developmental. Sure. I might see a bunch of these kids um, ultimately go pro, but you got to put together. A, uh, you got to put together a title. Right. Otherwise, it everyone's fear of Jerry taking over at Oregon was it was just becoming this feeder program for Nike and, and like going to the pro ranks, you got to put, you got to put together a team title. You got to put together uh, an actual, something with the Oregon brand on it. Otherwise everybody's uh, major fears, I think are going to be realized. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree with you. You know, Oregon, obviously an esteemed name and esteemed program in the distance space. Right. But Jerry Schumacher, the head coach, a distance guy. Previous coach, Robert Johnson, was not necessarily a distance guy. Brings on two assistant coaches in Shalane Flanagan and um, Chris Selinski, who are esteemed distance coaches. Like To me, this feels like a concerted effort to uh, you know, really trying to bring Oregon back to its root, roots as a distance powerhouse. Um, not to mention that while the, the entities will be practicing at different times, uh, that Oregon Track Club will also now be based, or Bowerman Track Club, rather, will be now based in Eugene, mm-hmm. practicing on the same facilities. Surely these college kids are going to see the Bowerman athletes in passing from time to time. I think that it sets itself up to potentially really facilitate like a, a successful culture there. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, I think that Oregon, you know, really seemingly reinvesting in the distance program is good for the overall sport, right? Like when you mm-hmm. think of cross country programs uh, on like a historical scale, Oregon is near the top of that list, and you know, I think it's, I think it's amazing to see them kind of reinvesting. It'll be interesting to see you know, what recruits they're able to pull in aside from the ones that they already have lined up. It looks like Parker Valby is staying at Florida, which is sensible. It's closer to home, but she's not mm-hmm. going to be leaving with uh, Solinsky. But I'm assuming that they have, uh, you know, a lot of recruiting potential just given the power of their coaching staff there. Absolutely. And they're going to need it because, you know, we have even in their own conference, Things are crazy, right? The Pac-12 is just forever just the best place for distance running in in the NCAA Division One. Sure, I'm a homer. Yes, clearly I was like drinking out of the Stanford track and field uh, tumbler. But, um, I mean, you have Stanford, right, who have, what, three of the top returners uh, going into next season on top of – the two highest recruited high schoolers coming into the program with the, with the young brothers. So like Stanford is in your backyard. They're always going to be difficult for, for you to chase down Colorado always sleepy as long or sleep like a sleeper, as long as Wetmore's there, like you have to believe that they can step up like Utah, Utah got good. Like everyone in the, in, in the conference is, is going to push them. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they, how they recruit. But with these types of big names, they're going to be able to recruit nationally. And I think that that's really where this comes into play. We see it more with football where you can actually get a recruit from, you know, Kansas to come all the way to Oregon. But now with, with another big name on their coaching staff, uh, they're, they're going to be in a position where they might be able to legitimately pull some folks from, you know, from Illinois, from Montana. Like they hopefully have the recruiting staff who can really also dig in and find some of those hidden gems because, 
since, you know, the, the Cesarek and Jenkins days, you know, we've only really ever had like two big stars at Oregon at a time, right? You have, you have uh, Cole and Cooper, but you, you know, Charlie was somewhere um, in, in the mix, but you don't have five. You, they haven't had five. You haven't had folks spanning across all the distance events on the track um, to be able to bring in those critical points because, you know, you have a stud on the men's side uh, in the 100 and 200 in the sprints, but then you're, you're giving up most of your points in the distance and you're just not going to be able to win a championship that way. So uh, yeah, I think they're in a, they're in a great position, but I will say really quickly, it makes perfect sense that Parker staying in Florida because my guy, Will Palmer getting the gig, filling in for, for Selinski, Williams alum. So, you know, I got to, got to support when a D three guy has made a huge climb in the coaching ranks. Uh, obviously did some great work at Alabama and super stoked to see what he does uh, running the show on the distant side down in Florida. So uh, yeah, Parker's going to be in good hands. And we'll, we'll save this for probably a future chat, but is Amaris Tenisma? Is she gonna follow him to Florida? Or is she gonna stay put at Alabama, or is she gonna go somewhere else? You know, rumors are swirling. But what is, what is your kind of gut reaction right now to what Tenisma is gonna be doing? I I think she's gonna move um, because Alabama reloads well, um, but it's it can be flighty, right? They've been very top heavy. And so to be able to be with someone else who's already established at the top, it, it it's less pressure on her to have to like drive and build the program. So um, it's not that not that far away, Bama to Florida in terms of uh, sort of culture and uh, adjustment, climate, all those types of things. So I I'm thinking I'm thinking she's going to make the move. And, you know, she's she's solid, but a lot of people sleep on her because she wasn't. Mercy, right? Because she wasn't the front runner of that team. This is a chance for her to really uh, sort of come out of her shell. Parker's going to have a very different strategy, right? She'll always run out the front. And then and then Taisma's just like chilling. And that's a great way to break up uh, a race. You know, you can still go one, two, one, three by, you know, having one person draw out the crowd breakaway style. And then you just move your way through the pack and then catch your teammate and ultimately win. So I think it's 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 built for success if she wants to take it for sure it'll be interesting to see kind of yeah where where she ends up uh or whether she decides to say moving on skylar to topic number three race season kicking off this weekend on the roads houston marathon half marathon happening a lot of big names specifically in the half that field seems to be pretty loaded um any any kind of overarching thoughts or people that you really have your eye on uh, in this half marathon? Obviously, it sounds like Emily Sisson aiming for potentially a, an American record there. You got mm-hmm. Connor Mance uh, also running, looking to compete really well. A strong international contingent as well. Uh, what do you got your eyes on this weekend? Okay, so you mentioned Sisson, American record under threat. I got to think she takes it down. I would be more surprised if she doesn't um obviously i haven't looked at the weather and and those sorts of external factors but based on how she ran uh that that race last was it chicago was it um it's so what october uh you know she's pro- like she probably was damn near the split mid race of the full marathon. So this should be, uh, so this should be not a cakewalk because I think she's going to be pushed and and that's going to be helpful in this endeavor. But, um, but in terms of just like hitting the time, I think she's definitely set up for it. The thing I'm actually really interested in is a lot of the, uh, the folks that either this isn't their primary distance or they're debuting here for the first time. So on the women's side, Jenny Simpson, right. Moving up, running a half for the first time, we saw at Cherry Blossom last year uh, that she was she was itching to to get into some of the longer stuff. She's obviously had a very storied career on the track. Uh, I mean, her Instagram handle was Track Jenny for forever. Uh, and then we forget that she was a steeplechaser, right? So she had that inherent strength. She was not horrible at the steeple. She was just really good at the fifteen. So so to see that translate over um, into into the half is going to be great. 
And then like on the men's side, we're going to see some of the 10 man guys like a Brian Barraza, I think could be really good at the half. Like another steepler hasn't quite been able to make the jump into uh, sort of like U S final, you know, world team uh, type jumps, but like comes from the Steve Magnus, you know, school of coaching. It's obviously uh, a very methodical racer. I think that bodes well for someone on the roads where uh, you don't have a lap counter. That's kind of sort of like, okay, we got 500 to go. Like we start kicking. I think this is going to be interesting for him. So him uh, like Connor winter uh, is going to be out there for, for 10 man as well. So some of these debutantes uh, I'm going to be keeping my eyes on the front is going to be great and, and super thrilling to watch, but there's, there's some folks that, you know, we could be talking about winning a U.S. title here in the half or moving up to the full marathon and doing some big things uh, in, in the next three or four years to to really just sink our teeth into and, and start rooting for. Yeah, for sure. And I think circling back to the women's side, people who – I don't know if I should say this – like who I don't expect to be up at the – maybe necessarily like contending for a title but are exciting – stories to watch Tara Nash Dababa, which I, it's like blasphemy to say that because she's one of the greatest female distance runners of all time. Right. But she hasn't raced, uh, you know, in a while, like four years, four years. Right. Um, so I wouldn't expect her up at the front, but then again, she's super talented. Other people uh, of note, Molly Huddle, who's kind of mm-hmm. getting back into the swing of things racing or uh, yeah, starting to get kind of back into the swing of things. And then uh, Dom Scott, who I think arguably one of the most slept on uh, runners in the sport. Uh, just absolutely incredible. Her PR, I believe, is only a little bit slower than the American record. So it's not like, uh, you know, yeah. we talk about Emily Sisson chasing the American record and uh, and she's an incredible athlete, right? But Dom Scott, when she's clicking, uh, super incredible to watch. And then on the men's side, I can't believe you got through an entire discussion about this half marathon without mentioning King Chez. I, you listen, I knew you were going to do it. <laughs> you know, King Chez coming to a fast course, that to me is is really exciting. Um, just to kind of see what he can get, get done there. If he has a good day or if he keeps things together, I guess, should be under that hour mark. I would assume he ran an hour and 13 seconds at Valencia. Mm-hmm. Um I believe that the Houston course is quite a bit faster and the field is shaping up to be uh, really stout. And obviously can't can't move on without mentioning the Houston native Frankie, Frank Lara, uh, also coming back to Houston for the race. He's What I love about him is he's an incredibly gritty runner. You know, he, yes. uh, he might not you know, hang on for the win, but he's going to put himself, you know, in the race and really give him shot, give himself a shot. I mean, last year he went into this race was like, I'm going to, I'm going for the American record. Just like off the jump, his PR was like two and a half minutes slower than the American record, but that's the mentality he comes into this with, you know, really, really battle tested dude. So uh, yeah, he's, he's always one to watch. He's just always entertaining to watch from a racing perspective. What moves will he make? And how much can he push other people to get involved? And listen, I'm going to throw it out there. Going back to the chess thing real quick. You, we still doing Skechers? That's a good I mean, question. Li- listen, like if he's obviously like the coaching's there and his wife obviously crushing it right now. It, it might actually just be a shoe thing. Like it might just be a shoe thing that we haven't heard of Chez a lot. Like he's been winning Carlsbad every year. Um, like he's still putting down like decent times, but we, we just don't see him at the very forefront. Part I mean, obviously part of it might be a marketing thing from from the brand. And part of it just might be the shoe itself is not lending it lend, lending to him winning these big races yet. And I I hope that changes because you have the most prolific college runner in a generation. And he's basically, he wins what used to be a rock and roll race every year. And then we don't think about him again until we're talking about the Bowerman. So help me help you. That's what I'm saying, Chez. Yeah, I uh, I don't disagree there. Um, also, 
Edward Cheserek obviously robbed of the Bowerman in college. But I digress. Uh, we'll move on. Marathon field at Houston, not quite as stacked. Still a strong field. Uh, but when your race is the same week that Boston is annou- announcing their elite fields, it's a little bit tougher to really get people uh, stoked on this field. couple people that I'm keeping my, on, my eye on here before I uh, toss it over to you. Um, notable Americans on the men's side, C.J. Albertson, uh, always someone to mm-hmm. keep your eye on, especially – um, if you have any interest in uh, kind of like the ultra running space, which is a lot of what we do here at Aravipa. But then for me, on a personal note, on the lady side, Megan Krifshin of Atlanta Track Club, former Mizuno athlete, um, had an incredible fall marathon season. Am a little bit surprised that she is uh, trying to tack another one on, if I do, uh, if I am honest. Uh, I'll never bet against Megan. Uh, obviously, but sometimes when you're playing with fire, you get burned a little bit, and she's raced so much. Uh, so coming off of a, a really strong run at CIM and a PR, I believe, uh, to be back on the start line for the full at Houston surprised me a little bit, but no doubt in my mind that Megan can put together a, a strong race. So, Skylar, who do you have your eyes on in the uh, in the marathon field? Yeah, so this is this is basically uh, a short list because, as you mentioned, not not necessarily notable. Part of it is also because for the half marathon, uh, at least for the the U.S. athletes, the half marathon window to use that as your Olympic tri- trials qualifier just opened at the beginning of this year. So that might also be part of like, hey, let's just run a fast half, potentially OTQ from that, and if we can't, then stack it forward into your your Boston, your grandma's, you know, like something happening somewhere in the next, you know, four to six months. So I think that's part of it. Marathon windows already been open. So people aren't necessarily trying to uh, run the full other than Megan. Apparently. So uh, I think one of the, one of the interesting folks to, to watch is, uh, is it to show me So we're talking uh, someone who just got U S citizenship uh, last year. And so that's sort of like been the storyline coming into this race. Like, Oh, all of a sudden we're going to have, you know, a third or fourth American who can actually break two Oh, two Oh eight at 40, uh, behind, you know, Galen and Connor and uh, I guess Fobbs at this point. And so, so there's a chance that we might see like a legitimate American throw their hat in the ring and say, like, you thought you knew how the Olympic trials were going to go next year. Let me just go ahead and let you know that I'm taking Galen's spot at the top and y'all are just racing for second and third. So I think this is the first chance for us to really see um, how, how he shakes it out. And on the women's side, honestly, I'm just looking for like good competitive racing, right? For the last, the really the story of last year was how fast the women's marathon has gotten. But most of those races, other than basically like New York, it was kind of, a, we knew who was going to win by 30 K in. And so I want to see like an actual competitive gritty like performance. Like I actually want to see just like good racing. I think that draws out competitive, the, like the best times when you actually have to compete for these wins, when you're actually like going back and forth with folks. And so I'm just hoping that we don't see somebody go well off the front, get lost in, in the pacers or in the men's group. And then, you know, we end up with these like two and a half, three minute gaps on the women's side that that's really what I'm watching. Can we actually not just have fast times and time trial them, but actually have some legitimate racing uh, at the forefront as well. Yeah. I mean, that'll definitely be, uh, th- that would be something that's interesting. Hopefully it happens. I think that, sorry, my mind is racing with like, I think that that is why, uh, I think that that's why women's fields should almost have like their standalone, at least portions of, of the race in a way. Um, so that you get a little bit more competition, but we can go on that soapbox uh, a different time again. I think that the half marathon field, like you said, uh, with the window just opening, it makes a lot of sense. You're able to kick your season off with something you can recover from, uh, you know, then either gear up for an outdoor season if you want or uh, 
uh, start to look at something like grandma's if you still need a, a full qualifier or if you don't hit the half standard and want a full qualifier. Another one to note, um, Tagger Van Etten also running Houston. So have to give uh, a shout out to the Eastern Illinois alumni uh, there. So any other parting thoughts before we move on to topic number four here, Skyler? Uh, just just one last thing from a coverage standpoint, and it kind of gets back to that, that women's race. Uh, we've seen a couple times in the past, uh, a lot last year, but in the past couple of years, where the women's race gets lost in the men's race, you know, starting at the same time or just like because of Pacers, all of a sudden you're like, oh, the women's, the women's finisher or winner just crossed the line. And it's almost an afterthought or it just like doesn't get picked up. I'm really hoping uh, that – we turn around. We like we start off 2023 on a good foot in terms of coverage of the women's side. Gotta be better. Gotta be like, better. The women's the you know we we said it. The women's marathon was nuts last year. Like some of the high best all time performances, um, like in terms of depth throughout the entire season. We're seeing it domestically, uh, and and so it just makes sense to make sure that we're highlighting uh, the great things that the women are doing and. Uh, operationally it gets a little difficult because you have, you know, you might have 300 guys that are running, you know, 65 or faster or something. Um, and, then, and then the women are just like right tucked in and it's hard to, you know, for a motor uh, motor cam to follow it. But I I'm hoping, hoping that's that we're getting better at it. And yeah, in terms of, of covering the women's race. Awesome. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, coverage of the women's fields has to be better. I know that that was a complaint of mine following Houston, but moving on to topic number four here, Skylar, a little bit of a, a sponsor roundup here. So uh, I know that this is something that you always keep your thumb on the pulse of. I end up sending you Instagram clips that you had seen, you know, six or eight hours prior. So uh, why don't you give us a little bit of a quick rundown on all of the uh, kind of sponsor shakeups or the handful of sponsor shakeups that we've seen so far to kick off this year? Yeah, I think there's going to be a big week uh, for for further announcements. So we're we're going to be tracking this for a little bit further. This might be a uh, recurring uh, a recurring segment on the on the pod for the coming weeks here. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, you know, early on, it might have been the first shoe to drop. Honestly, uh, we started seeing the the exodus that we always see at the end of the year. Uh, but one that surprised me was uh, Natasha Rogers leaving Brooks Hansen's one of the most storied uh, training groups, training teams. They actually like race as a team regularly often. Um, the Ekadens that occurred in the middle of 2020 and 2021, they just ran cross champs. And now she is donning the Puma kit, uh, joining the likes of, of what is developing uh, to be a pretty stout middle distance group with Puma Elite. Uh, so she's, I mean, she literally was racing in that Brooks Hansen's kit through club champs last year or last literally last month so the the 10th or 11th of december uh so fresh change excited to see uh what she's getting into she made a world team for the first time after that devastating near miss uh what 2012 2013 uh and honestly, she's just a great follow. She's just a good spirit to get behind. If if you're looking for like folks for who sure. are just like having having a grand old time, that is that is an IG follow for sure. So super excited to see what she does with Puma, uh, who've been making great inroads uh, in the distance running space on top of the the sprint powerhouse that they had been for uh, for quite some time, sponsoring you know Canada and Jamaica for for all those years. Uh, somebody who. I think underperformed the past couple of years, and I'm very excited to see make a move. Uh, David Ribich making the move from uh, also from a Brooks team uh, going from the Beast up in Seattle over to Union Athletic Club, going the Nike route, which, you know, that that comes with some headaches, I'm sure for him. But Union has a decent, uh, I say that, under underwhelmingly uh decent 800 group with the likes of you know the the former u.s champion uh and so to see him really be able to shake off uh the past couple of years of stagnation trying to come back from injury will be interesting to see i mean he ran 335 last year in the 15 ran 336 in 2021 he made that u.s uh, olympic trials final but then took 12th like he's his best performances have always come in July, 
right just after you need them to qualify for a team. And so I think change will be good for him. Uh, and I'm excited to see what what he can do with with a set of fresh eyes uh, on his training and just a fresh training environment. I think that's going to go a long way for him. Uh, you mentioned sending me IG posts that I'd seen hours before. Uh, yeah, Josette the, Norris. Uh, the Josette Norris news, which there had been rampant speculation uh, that this was happening both by normal uh, track and field aficionados and on the cesspool that is the Let's Run message board. So I, f- I felt like I could kind of see this coming a little yeah. bit. But, yeah, leaves um, – she was with Reebok, but she was with a – was she with a club? I I think she was with the, the Reebok Boston club yep. that's, like, not actually based in Boston. Yep. It's, like, and the one that's, like, technically actually based in Virginia. Whatever. Moves, yes. to, moves to Boulder. Joins on Athletic Club, on Athletic Club putting together a really, really good distance squad. Between her and Sage, you have Sage heard of you have two of the like most underrated like women like running you know one fifty nine to two hundred one consistently in the eight hundred, piecing together great fifteen hundreds on a regular basis, but just like haven't quite made the jump where you're like, okay, they're always going to be in a diamond league final, but they both got great experience in those types of venues. And so this is going to be very interesting to see with them being able to train together. Um, Not to mention on the strength side, you still have, you know, Alicia Bonson, you still have a Helen O'Beary that are like floating around. Gosh, I forgot about the Helen O'Beary signing. I know that that was earlier last year, but man they're putting they're putting it together yeah it's not just on investing and and picking up runners for a a company that five years ago we had just a bunch of street reps going around to to group runs being like hey like we're new on the block and now they're building one of the most uh elite groups uh in 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 ultra running or not ultra running excuse me in, in, in trail and uh and track and road running um these sort of I mean, I guess they have ultra folks too, but, but I'm thinking like 13 miles down and being in Boulder is just a great training environment for this group. So, uh, you know, got, got international talent, but building it here, uh, domestically in the United States, allowing folks, allowing us fans to really get into the sport, which, um, it was clutch for Eugene, uh, the side of the world championships last year and thinking all the way forward to 2028, uh, when Los Angeles hosts the, the Olympics. It's gonna be it's gonna be a big deal. So shout out to OAC, good times. Andrew Weeding, way to way to keep grinding out, buddy. Yeah, love it. And then just a couple other notables on my end uh, in the NAZ Elite silo. Uh, love to get your thoughts on this one. Cruz Culpepper, uh, former Ole Miss um, uh, star standout, really strong runner at Ole Miss. Leaving, uh, I don't know what his eligibility status actually is. I think Still he's a it. sophomore, uh, but yeah. it's all it's all jumbled currently. COVID years, weird. Um, yeah. And then Paige Stoner, also the marathoner, uh, Syracuse alum, I believe, also right. signed uh, with NAZ Elite. And to wrap a big bow on it, Steph Bruce unretiring before she even like fully went into retirement. So. Uh, just in the grand scope of the NAZ Elite shakeup, what are your thoughts? How are you feeling about it all? One, before I do pass it over to you, super stoked that Steph is unretiring. Good for the yeah. sport uh, to have Steph Bruce in it. So, Absolutely. Now, Steph, Steph is a gem um, and just like a true ambassador of what you want the sport to be. I mean, I've been at a number of races that she's been at and just the time she takes with fans – um, but then you see her playing with her kids. Like it's just, it's, it's everything you, you want it to be. Uh, it's everything you want professional athletes to be in the sport. So, so super stoked for her, um, to, to stay on the grind, uh, to stay on the grit tour. We're going to keep it moving forward. So that, I think it really bodes well for NAZ elite. Obviously last year was a big, big year of change for them, uh, going from, from Ben Rosario over to Cole Pepper as coach. So Cruz coming to hang out with his dad. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Um, you know, we had some – Cruz specifically had some success at Washington, made the move to Ole Miss. But, you know, it when when Ole Miss's coach 
took off. I think this was just like the prime time for him to say, like, I just want some stability and I want to be able to, again, as we talked about, this window is such a prime window for, for elite athletes that are, you know, developing or right at the cusp. You know, he has, uh, you know, what, high 330s, low 340, 1500. He's a sub four miler. You know, to be able to dedicate all of his focus for the next, you know, 15 months to hit the standard, you know, if he doesn't make the world championship team this year, um, which the 1500 is always kind of a crapshoot in the U.S., then, you know, to gain all that experience and be able to, to set himself up to try to make that Paris team, I think that works out well. And Paige, way to get your bag because you just ran CIM, win a U.S. title, um, you know, already knock out uh, a healthy OTQ. So you're set up. You don't have to really worry about much of anything uh, until February of 2024. And she's like, yeah, I'm going to go to a place that has the last Olympic trials champion, one of the most decorated uh, runners in, in the recent U.S. history. And then also, yeah, by the way, we have Kellen Taylor also just like chilling there who's like no slouch uh, uh, of herself. Like that's a great marathon group to, to connect with for, well, for training and, and, to, and just knowledge. And for NAZ Elite to now be coached by someone who knows what it takes to make the an Olympic team, right? Like that's yeah. obviously no knock at all on Ben Rosario. What he was able to get out of his athletes there at NAZ Elite as a coach was incredible. And he's moving mm-hmm. up. He's staying on at NAZ Elite as I believe like an admin yeah, like type an operations. Role. Yeah, like guy, an operations yeah. type guy. But to have, you know, Alan Culpepper coming in uh, as the coach, he knows what it takes, like I said, to to make teams. I think that that bodes well for some of these athletes and for Paige Stoner to, yeah, I mean, have an incredible run at CIM, right? Like that was a, over almost a three-minute PR, I think. Yeah. Um, I think that she had run something here in Arizona that was around 229, um, before CIM, where she ran 226.02. Um, huge shout out to her for, you know, make, putting her stamp uh, on, like, where she stands in the sport, right? But also yeah. securing that bag, you know? You got to, you know, being able to get, to get that sponsorship and to be able to join a team that can kind of help get her to the next level. The ladies' side at NAZ Elite is incredible, Um on the road space. So before we move on, any other sponsor shakeups that uh, you have for us? No, I think those are the big ones right now uh, on, on the track side. Obviously I'm going to be interested to see uh, where some of the folks that have announced uh, that they've left their previous sponsor, where they're going to end up. Um, some folks are still dabbling around. You end up with a, you know, Ali Ostrander. She's running U S cross championships next week. Is she going to debut in a, in a new kit uh, yeah, after having left the the Beast early last year? I'll be interested to see how that shakes out. And then, I, honestly, I'm waiting to see if there's going to be a new training group that comes together. Um, obviously, like Puma Elite was one of the, the later ones to come together. Uh, last year, we saw Taylor made Elite uh, with Diljeet uh, Taylor, the head women's coach at BYU, uh, also taking on some of her former athletes at, in, in an elite group. But we've heard rumblings for years um, that there are a couple other shoe companies that want to put something together. You know, I'm a big fan of the the team boss model, just like bring people together regardless of shoe brand and just sort of like being shoe agnostic and just like training them together. But I, I want to see if we get like a true group coming together, uh, you know, that that could really help elevate American distance running. We're, we're at a position where like, we just we we need to capitalize on the momentum that that we that we have in, in this window right now. Yeah, I mean this next five year window is is a big moment for U.S. distance running, right? Like you've got, like I said, world champs in Budapest this year. You've got Paris Olympics. You have uh, world champs in twenty twenty five, which off the top of my head can't recall where. You'll have other races, but all in the build for 2028 LA, Mm -hmm. um, which is, I think, a big moment for the sport, but definitely for the U.S. as a whole. And so taking a step away from the sponsor news and and our last topic here, Skylar, and this will kind of also be our kind of finishing thoughts is what are the things that you are most looking forward to or most excited about in 2023? 
Yeah, there's just so many things that could just be an absolute hilarious mess. <laughs> um, first off, just again, I think we're going to see some crazy things happen on the college side uh, in the outdoor season. We saw the men really step their game up in the mile last year. Um, part of it's shoe technology. Part of it's just like, hey, if 50 other folks can run 358 or faster, why can't I? So to continue to see that momentum is going to be something, um, especially because – in the 800 and the 1500, the U.S. is in a very interesting position right now. Uh, they, especially that 800, but uh, but that 1500 is it's prime for the taking. You have a Jared Nagus who came out of nowhere, had a horrible college season, and then ran 334 uh, and put himself in position. But you still have Cole Hawker. You know, all of a sudden we're gonna have like Eric Holt showing up and like potentially getting third. I, I don't, things are gonna be crazy. Um, so I'm excited to see a lot more college kids, uh, you know, continuing that trend. And then the women's side is ready for that same breakthrough. And it's just a matter of time. So until we start really seeing like, Oh, we have, you know, this many college women running sub 422, 420, 418, and then really going to help push uh, our mid distance that direction. And then uh, yeah, this is the year I'm calling it. We're going to have American men, actually run sub 20850 all right we're gonna do it we're gonna have more than three guys do it i just want to see um with with all the talk of shoe technology all the talk of you know updated training methodology the u.s marathon uh on the men's side is gonna catch up to where the women are on the u.s side u.s women have been crushing on a regular basis actually performing at the international level the men i think this is the year we finally actually see some something switch uh, to to have them elevate their game to a point where they're actually competitive at some of these world marathon majors. Still got a ways to go. You know, Kipchoge's still going to be seven minutes ahead of them, but but we're, we're going in the right direction. So, um, so that's what I'm excited for. And then again, it's just going to be the growth of the sport. You had a, a, a local a domestic world championships. You have another world championships this year. Um, it's, it's easy. It's an easy sport to latch onto, right? We've seen running broadly, uh, get more popular. It's still the most participated in sport, uh, for youth. And so this is with media, uh, coming together and making these athletes and the events more accessible. Uh, hopefully we start to see the viewership follow, um, so that folks get excited for not just that next Olympics, but really the long grind, uh, to LA in 2028. But what about you? You 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 have a different lens on this. Like yeah. you you're help I definitely me do. Understand. I think that I'll keep this short. I think that the thing that excites me the most is a continual growth in coverage in modern coverage of the sport. And what I mean by that is, you know, we saw Sound Running and some other entities last year do um, live stream uh, of more track and field races, so you're able to tune in. If you're a real diehard fan mm -hmm. of the sport, um, you're able to, to tune in and, and see more races. And then we saw, I think, obviously, you know, Chris Chavez and the team there have been doing stuff for a long time or for a little while at Sidious Mag, but last year being like Chris's first year going all in on Sidious Mag as a full-time thing, and then their coverage of – uh, the 2023 or the 2022 uh, Eugene World Championships, like mm -hmm. the way they package that content, I thought was next level. And then hopefully we're able to just do a small bit of helping move the sport forward through coverage. But I think that that's the thing that excites me the most is an increase in attention and coverage of the sport, an increase in modern coverage of the sport, an increase in you know storytelling and getting people to buy into these athletes and these teams. I think that 2023 is the year where you have a lot of uh, newer media outlets or people who want to share their opinions on the sport. And I think that it's a great opportunity for, uh, you know, growing the sport and growing the athlete stories in there as well. So before we uh, wrap it up, any, any kind of parting thoughts uh, before we uh, call it a show? Man, I'm just excited to be doing this with you. You know, we we've been talking about it for for a long time. We're both former track guys that allegedly still run trails mostly, but um, but you know, we we have a lens uh, on the sport from a from a history. Like we we were running in college before Tifers was like forced upon 
programs. People can't even find all of our results. So, uh, so, so, so we've been in, in this for a while, but I'm super excited to uh, be able to chat about it and, you know, recognizing that we both come from the Aravipa space. And so a lot of the folks that, you know, might be joining us on this journey are, you know, might be doing longer events, trail stuff, or just might be new uh, to the running ecosystem broadly and are trying to understand uh, some, some of the, the shorter, faster things, you know, happy to be able to, to translate it down and, 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 and bring it, bring it to the people, give the people what they want. So dude, I'm stoked. Yeah. I'm I mean, stoked. these what are, are, what you got? I, like, these are conversations that I feel like you and I have over either Instagram DMS or uh text message on like almost a daily basis. And All the time. I'm just excited to be able to share the conversations that we already have typically, like even before we hit record on this podcast, we were like basically talking just like we are now. And hopefully, you know, we can just get people interested in the sport, right? Like that's kind of what it's, what it's all about is, you know, I think that I probably speak for you as well. Like we grew up in track and field, track and field kind of uh, like played such a huge role in our lives and to just be able to do a little bit to give back to both the sport of track and field, but also to get more people interested, I think is what I'm most interested in. And like talking track and field, is awesome. So it's a lot easier to f follow 17 events in the course of like five hours than it is to follow a hundred mile race throughout the day. You know, it's, exactly. it's, it's super accessible for folks. And so we want to, we want to help bring it to you. So by all means, if you got questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, needs, or emotions, let us know. That's, that's what we're here for. We're going to keep bringing it to you all year um, and, and beyond because it's, it's a wild time. And it takes two wild guys to help bring it to you. And that's what we are here for. Well, I think that is going to do it for this week's episode. We haven't really discussed uh, what cadence we're going to do these on, but if you enjoyed the episode, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Make sure you leave a comment uh, so that we know that, that you're interested and we'll kind of keep recording these conversations. But that's going to do it for today. I am your host, Matt Feldick, joined by my esteemed colleague, Skylar Hall. Let's have a great track and field season. Let's get it. Catch you guys next time.